thank you for what you offered our community on Wednesday night. It was a great showing, young and old people uh, getting to meet each other, uh, not just from uh, members of the church meeting each other, but meeting uh, friends from our community. So thank you for the ways uh, that you poured yourselves out uh, for that. It makes a difference in our community, and I want to thank you for being a church uh, that sees that as a priority. Uh, today we're continuing in our series. We started it last week. Uh, I, I told you last week that this series was planned over a year ago, uh, put during these five weeks, and I think it's God's movement to place what we're talking about at this moment in time. We're talking about the Apostles' Creed that we said just a few minutes ago that we say every Sunday uh, in this worship service. Uh, and it's an opportunity each week for us to profess our faith. But it was written, it was put together for a lot of reasons to express scripture, to help people anchor their faith, but particularly to help them anchor their faith in uncertain times. And that's why we're looking at it uh, in these weeks. Last week, we looked at the first article of the creed where it talks about uh, I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and what we talked about last week is how uh, God is this spirit that hovers over the chaos not just the chaos uh, pre-creation but the chaos in our lives and brings new life out of it this week we're going to talk about the second article uh, of the creed and here's what Karl Barth uh, 20th century theologian says about the second article of the creed. He says the second article does not just follow the first, nor does it precede the third. It is the foundation of light by which the other two are lit. It's the life of Jesus that for us allows us to understand and see uh, what we claim uh, when we talk about God the Father, what it means when we claim uh, the Holy Spirit at work in our world. Our scripture that we're going to read today to help us think through this is from Colossians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 15, read through verse 23. He, and the he there is Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, the, you he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through his death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for those who drew together the words of the creed over the course of centuries. God, although some Sundays uh, the creed becomes for us just words that, that come out of our mouth, they're words that shape us and make us in ways we don't understand as we profess what it is we believe about you. Today, God, allow us to hear about the light the light that came into the world to transform how not only we understand all of your work, but how we see our work in the world as well. So speak to us today by your spirit of the one who is our life and our hope and our reconciler. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. We're going to start today with a little U.S. history, a little quiz for you today. Let's, let's see how good uh, your junior high history teacher was. 
We're going to start with a warm-up question. We're going to start with something easy. Um, who was the first president of the United States? That was. If you don't know that, th I can't help you, right? <laughs> but now whisper to the person beside you just so you don't give it away to everybody. Who was the third president of the United States? Just whisper, don't shout it out loud. Real quickly. Thomas Jefferson. Did you know that? Anybody miss that one? Don't, you don't have to don't tell, tell on yourself. It's okay. But uh, if you didn't know, if you do know that, thank your, your history teacher. Write them a note today to thank them for that. Now, what we know about Thomas Jefferson is that he was a brilliant and weird guy, right? He was brilliant. It was his writings that, uh, that really set the stage for the American Revolution, his writings about human rights and freedom. Uh, he was the primary author of the Declaration of Independence, the third president of the United States. But one thing that not a lot of people talk about, maybe even know about, was that after he left office, he put together, he pieced together his own version of the New Testament. Here's what he did. He got several copies of the New Testament, different versions, some in Latin, some in Greek, and he took a razor and he cut out uh, the parts of uh, the Gospels that he wanted to keep. And he would paste them in another book until he finally completed his version of the New Testament, his version of the life, what he called the life and morals of Jesus. And here's what was in his telling of uh, the story of Jesus. All the teachings, all of his life events, but he left out all of the miracles and he left out the resurrection, anything that smacked of the supernatural, he left out. Here's the thing, Thomas Jefferson was interested in Jesus. He wanted to study Jesus, but the Jesus he knew and the Jesus he studied, simply a small Jesus, a reduction of the truth of Jesus. The Jesus he got to know was a lesser Jesus. And one of the reasons that the creed was written was to help people understand the fullness of the truth of Jesus, people just like us. Because here's what was going on in those early centuries after the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. People had questions. They wondered who this Jesus really was. Was Jesus God? Was Jesus just some human who had some special abilities? Was Jesus adopted by God? Uh, did Jesus replace the God of the Old Testament? They didn't understand who Jesus was. And so the people who shaped the creed over the course of multiple centuries pieced together what it was we needed to know about this Jesus. That Jesus was the Son of God, but also our Lord. That this Jesus lived on earth and uh, in the creed it details all the things that Jesus did on earth. But proclaims that now Jesus sits at the right hand of God to save people, to save us from worshiping a lesser Jesus. But here's the truth. We still do that. We still struggle uh, to worship the truth of Jesus. We still settle in our day and age for a lesser Jesus. Let me tell you what I mean by that. So often we reduce Jesus to a teacher or a philosopher, or we make Jesus' life simply about a morality of love, living love. Sometimes we reduce Jesus to our politics, right? We turn Jesus into Republican Jesus or Democrat Jesus. Capitalist Jesus, socialist Jesus. Sometimes we reduce Jesus into someone who looks and sounds and acts a lot like we do. We continue to do what the early church did. We make Jesus small. And you might be thinking, well, what's the problem with that, Eddie? What's the, what's the issue? At least people are learning something about Jesus. At least Thomas Jefferson knew something about Jesus. Here's what's at stake for us. When we sever Jesus from the full truth of who he is, then we lose the basis of our hope. We lose the basis of our peace when things get difficult. We lose sight of the abundant life that has been promised to us by Jesus. But here's, here's the big thing. Here's the main issue for us. When we settle for a smaller Jesus, 
then we lose our identity. We lose our identity as sons and daughters of God, set free and forgiven by the grace of Jesus Christ. When we settle for a smaller Jesus, we lose the heart of who we are. And what the creed does week after week as it opens our eyes and our ears to the great truth of who Jesus is. There's a moment in scripture uh, where we know people were struggling with the same thing. It's the letter that Paul wrote uh, to the church at Colossae. Uh, we call it the letter to the Colossians. Uh, Paul wrote this letter probably near the end of his life. And what we know is that the church in Colossae was struggling with what they believed about Jesus. Now, for centuries, scholars have tried to figure out what the error was, what was the problem. And we, dozens and dozens of solutions have been offered uh, to what Paul was fighting against, what Paul was trying to correct. But what we can know, even if we can't know exactly what it was, what we can know is that the people had settled for less, less than who Jesus really was. And so Paul writes this letter to give them a vision again of their hope in Jesus Christ. And what I love about the way Paul writes this letter is that Paul doesn't come out swinging for the people who are wrong. Instead, he invites them into this conversation. He overwhelms them with the beauty of Jesus. Here's how he starts uh, after all the introductory stuff in verses 13 and 14. He's talking about what God has done in Jesus and the he at the start of verse 13 is God the Father. God the Father has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. God the Father has rescued us us, has saved us from the powers of darkness and pulled us into a new reality, a new way of being in the world. And he, he's done all this through his son. So who is this Jesus? Who is the son who is the rescuer? And that's what we get in the next six verses, verses 15 through 20. And I, I've talked about this a lot. It, we miss so much uh, because we don't speak first century Greek, right? Uh, we miss things. And what we miss in verses 15 through 20 is what is there, what Paul has pulled together, is Paul is offering them an early Christian hymn. The pieces of an early Christian hymn to help them think about who Jesus is. Uh, apparently, early in the church, they expressed their theology and they learned their theology from the hymns that they sang. So let me ask you this, what's your favorite hymn? What's your favorite hymn that over the course of time has taught you about Jesus? Turn to somebody close to you, just whisper, tell them the name of your favorite hymn, the one that for you teaches you about Jesus. You mark it, set, go. From the front row, we got Great is Thy Faithfulness. I'm sure all of your hymns were great, but none of them are Be Thou My Vision. So uh, we'll talk, we can talk about why you're wrong uh, later. But we still learn about Jesus through our hymns. And that's the great gift that we, we miss here is that Paul is, is showing that you sing this, you know this. So here, here's the truth of this Jesus you sing about. Here's how it starts. I want to read just a few of the verses of that hymn to you. He, that's Jesus, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It starts out with the word image, and the Greek behind that is icon. Here's what you need to know about an icon in the ancient world. An icon was a picture that you saw through. You saw through the icon to the truth of something else. Jesus is the icon. We see through the icon to see the good news and the love and the grace of our heavenly Father who has rescued us. But there's more. 
The hymn says that Jesus is the first Born of creation. Now that doesn't mean that God created Jesus first. Firstborn means uh, it's it's a word that implies rank. In other words, Jesus is above all of creation, and we see that in the way the hymn talks about him. That in him and through him, all things have been created. But there's more than just that. In Jesus, all things hold together. Jesus is the one. And his creative power continues to hold the world together. The hymn starts out with this great vision of cosmic Jesus. This Jesus who is above and before and in and through all things. The one who has authority over all of creation and all who are in creation. And if that's all we heard about Jesus, that would be enough. But it's not all the hymn teaches us about Jesus. Here's what we get in verses 18 through 20. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him the full, all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Here we have this picture of Jesus, the one who has been cosmic in the heavens, involved in the creation, holding all things together, and yet now inserting himself into the flow of history. Why? That he might draw a people together, us, the church, that we might know the one who is still creating, but there's even more. It's not just so we can know the one who has and is creating, but so that we might know the one who is reconciling all things to himself. The word reconcile means to make right, to heal what is broken. This cosmic Jesus, the creator of all things, has entered into history so that our relationship with God might be finally and fully healed. And it was done through the blood and the work of the cross. In a moment, in a time where people conquered the world through violence, what we're told is the violence was done to Jesus, not from Jesus. So that the world, all things might be reconciled to him. This is the vision that we are given. Uh, that the God of all creation is also the God who has come among us to make things right. It's not enough to say that Jesus is a teacher. It's not enough to say that Jesus is a, a moral philosopher. It's not enough to say uh, that Jesus uh, likes us. What we're called to know is the fullness of of a Savior who has come to rescue us, come from the heavens above into our world. In our response to this, what Paul talks about multiple times throughout the letter, our response is simply this, that we're called to live in Christ. He says that back uh, in chapter 1, verse 2, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And what he means there is now, because of the reconciliation, now we are drawn into the work of Jesus. We are drawn into the work of new creation. We are drawn into the work of reconciliation. We are no longer defined by the things in the world that seek to define us. We are no longer defined by our work. We're no longer defined by any brokenness. We're no longer defined by any disappointments in life. In Christ, we are defined by the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what that teaches us about the church, about our gathering, is that Christianity is not a cause, is not an ideology, it's not a political system, it's not a philosophy, it's not a new type of morality or social ethic. Christianity is good news. Good news that beauty, truth, and goodness are found in a person. And in that person, death, terror, Fear and darkness meet their match. True humanity, 
true community are experienced now in connection with Christ. Christ was and is and is to come and ensures all of us will be drawn into full reconciliation. I love how one translation of this passage puts it. It says, all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies. We're drawn together. And when we live in Christ, Jesus recreates how we see our place in the world. Instead of despair, we see hope. Instead of darkness, we understand that light is coming. Tuesday of this week is a holiday. Uh, it's a festival. Anybody know what is happening on Tuesday? Some of you know, right? Somebody knows? Some people call it Halloween. In the church, we also call it All Hallows' Eve because it's the night before All Saints. But there's another thing that we celebrate on October 31st. It's Reformation Day. October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther uh, nailed his 95 theses onto the Wittenberg church door. Uh, he ignited, uh, ignited the work of the Reformation on that day. And here's what happened after that. He spoke, people rallied around him. But the Catholic Church made him their enemy and sought to arrest him and execute him for what he had done. And so there were often days, as he was a hunted man, that he would slip off into deep depression. And it fell to his wife, Katerina, uh, to help lift him out of depression, to bring him back to the light. And there was one time where no matter what she did, she could not bring him out of his deep darkness, out of his depression. So she went upstairs and she dressed in her black funeral dress, put on her black funeral veil and came back down, sat at the table with her husband, Martin Luther, and just sat there with him until he finally looked up and he asked her, are you going to a funeral? And this is how she responds. She said, no, but since you act like God is dead, I wanted to join you in your mourning. Since you act like God is dead. How often, even though we have been given the song to sing, even though we proclaim week after week the truth that we believe in the Son of God, our Lord, who's exalted at the right hand of God, how often do we live as if God is dead? That we have forgotten the good news of Jesus. So how do we, how do we hold on to that in our world? Let me give you a couple things that we uh, can do. The first thing that we can do is that we can root ourselves more deeply in Christ. What if whenever you face crisis or chaos in your life, what if whenever you feel darkness moving in, what if your first response was not to give up or to despair, but to root yourself more deeply in the story of Jesus, to remember again and again and again the goodness, how the God of the universe in Jesus has come down among us that we might know hope and life and light. What if when the world pushed against you and pushed you down, your response was to go to the Gospel of Luke and simply read the Gospel of Luke or to read uh, the letter to the Colossians or read, uh, read Ephesians or Philippians to remember again and again the goodness of Jesus Christ in his fullness, not the small Jesus, but the fullness of our Savior and our Rescuer. Lynn Sweet wrote a book called Jesus Manifesto, and in it he says this, God is not so much about fixing things that have gone wrong in our lives as he is about finding us in our brokenness and giving us Christ, because Christ is enough. Root yourself more deeply in Christ. And then maybe it's this. Maybe it's time for you to flip the script, to live differently, to speak differently, to see the world differently. That if we profess Jesus every Sunday, to live as if Jesus matters in our lives. Because here's the script that the world gives us. The script that the world gives us is everything is bad. Everything is broken. Everything is falling apart. 
Uh, the world gives us a script of cynicism and darkness, of anger and hatred and vengeance. That's the script the world gives us. So what if as followers of Jesus, we flip that? Into a world mired in darkness, we spoke about the light of Christ. To a world broken in so many ways, we talked about the one who comes to reconcile and heal and make new. What if we were people in a world bent on vengeance and anger, we did all that we could in every way that we could to err on the side of grace over and over and over again. Here's the thing, I, I don't know uh, how the Israeli-Hamas war ends. I don't know how to fix our broken political system. I don't know how to end the gun violence that plagues our nation. I don't know any of that. But what I do know is that week after week, we profess to believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And maybe it's time for us as followers of Jesus to live in that. This morning, I wanna encourage you to pick one of those two to live into this week. Maybe for you, uh, your world right now is chaos. Maybe you're feeling the heaviness of life. Maybe for you, you feel like you can just reach out and touch the darkness. Maybe this week, it's time for you to root yourself in the story of Jesus and pick up the story. Or maybe right now for you, life, life's going okay, but you realize in the conversations that you have and what you're watching and how you're repeating what you're watching, your script is actually not the life of Jesus, but the words of our world. Maybe it's time for you, specifically in your family, or maybe uh, at your workplace or at school, to speak words of hope and life and reconciliation. So I want to pray for you. Uh, maybe for you it's to root yourself. Maybe it's time for you to flip the script, that you would have the courage this week to live what we believe about Jesus. Let me pray for you. God, there are those here today who feel life pressing in on them. They know the darkness and the heaviness God, may the story of Jesus speak life to them. May they see in the story of Jesus the hope that they are a son or a daughter of Christ. And know that they are cared for and loved. Maybe, God, there are those who have found themselves caught up in the negativity of this age. Set us free from that that our lives might reveal your goodness, the hope that has been given to us, the freedom offered to us. In all things, God, may we be free from a Jesus that is too small. May we reset our vision on the fullness of who he is for our world and for us. It's in his name that we pray, amen. Our closing hymn today is one of the hymns we used to sing uh, at my small church on Sunday nights. One of the great, maybe one of you mentioned it earlier, Jesus is all the world to me. Would you stand as we sing together?